Hi, I'm Perry West, President and Founder of Automated Vision Systems. In the first three videos in this series, you learned what light is and is not, the properties of light, and how light interacts with materials. In this video, we're going to build on those three and give you more details in how light operates. These details will allow you to be more effective in your machine vision work. So let's get started. What you will cover in this video is more about how light is reflected and transmitted from surfaces. We'll talk more about the absorption of light and what happens when light is absorbed. Then we're going to go into a little more detail about transmission. Then we're going to talk about something very interesting about polarization. We'll talk then about diffraction that really limits the optical performance we can achieve in a vision system. And finally, we'll talk about interference and how light interacts with itself that may be useful to you or may present some challenges to you. When light reflects off of some kinds of surfaces, there are things that happen that you may not expect. This is explained by Fresnel reflection. Here's a quick experiment with a beam of light. The beam is traveling from left to right. On the right side, I placed a clear, flat glass plate, angled it just a little bit, and you can see that some of the light reflects off of the glass plate. Here's the formula that can tell us exactly how much reflection we will have off of a surface between two indices of refraction. Now this formula is good just for light that falls perpendicular to the surface. If we plug in the indices of refraction for air, that is just about 1, and glass, that is just right around 1.5, we find that about 4% of the light is reflected off of the surface between air and glass. Now if we reverse the indices of refraction so that we're going from glass back into air, we find that we also are losing about 4% of the light to reflection. So if we have light going through a window, we're going to lose 4% of the light when we go from air into glass, and another 4% when we go from glass back into air. So light going through a window is going to lose about 8% of its energy. This may have you wondering. A modern lens has five glass elements. That maybe is 10 glass to air surfaces. That could mean you could lose up to a third of the light energy just when the light passes through the lens. Well, fortunately, there are coatings that can dramatically reduce the loss of light. And we'll talk about those coatings in another video series. Here is another quick experiment. I've placed a glass plate at about 45 degrees, and I'm reflecting a beam of light off of the glass plate into the camera. Now watch what happens when I take a polarizer and place it in between the camera and the plate of glass. As I rotate the polarizer, the intensity of the reflected light changes. This suggests that there's some polarization component to the reflected light off of the glass. When unpolarized light is incident on a surface, half of its energy is polarized parallel to the plane of reflection. We sometimes call this the P component for parallel. And half of its energy is polarized perpendicular to the plane of reflection. And we sometimes call this the S component, where S stands for the German word for perpendicular. And what we just saw in the demonstration is that there is a preferred direction of polarization, so the reflected light, as a matter of fact, becomes partially polarized. And likewise, the transmitted light becomes partially polarized. Equations describing the reflection and transmission for both the parallel and perpendicular components as a function of angle were developed by a scientist by the name of Fresnel. And this is why we often refer to this reflection as Fresnel reflection. The good thing is it's not necessary to remember the formulas to work in machine vision. What is important to remember is that when light is reflected, it becomes partially polarized. One interesting uh, characteristic we can get from the Fresnel equations is that when the angle between the reflected and transmitted lights is equal to 90 degrees, 
Then it turns out that the reflected light component that's parallel to the plane of reflection is zero, and the reflected light becomes completely polarized. This angle of incidence is known as Brewster's angle. Returning to our previous experiment, I've changed the angle of the glass plate and the angle of the light source so that the light is reflecting off of the glass plate at approximately Brewster's angle. Now you notice that when I rotate the polarizer in front of the camera lens, the reflected light is completely attenuated. This shows that the reflected light at Brewster's angle is entirely polarized. Here is a graphical illustration of Fresnel reflection. That you'll notice that the parallel polarized light is extinct at Brewster's angle, but that the perpendicularly polarized light continues to reflect as the angle of incidence gets greater. And this graph is true for a dielectric such as glass. A dielectric is a material that doesn't conduct electricity. Here's a similar graph for polished metal. You'll notice that the reflectivity is much higher than glass, but you'll also notice that the light polarized parallel to the plane of reflection is somewhat attenuated. This means that the reflected light off of metal can be partially polarized. In the previous video, we talked about what happens when light is absorbed into a material, and that most often it's converted into heat energy. But there are some other things that can happen, so let's explore this a bit deeper, because these are important characteristics. To understand absorption and its nuances, we need to know a little bit about the properties of materials, in particular the electrons that surround the nucleus. Quantum physics tells us that electrons can only exist in specific energies, called energy bands. And the outer band that the electrons can exist in is called the valence band. There is an energy band above the valence band where if electrons reach it, they can move around, and that's called the conduction band. In between the valence band and the conduction band is the forbidden band, that is, electrons of a material are not permitted to have this energy. For an insulator, the forbidden band is very large. Therefore, it's just impractical to impart enough energy to an electron to get it to move from the valence band into the conduction band. Now, other materials like metal that conduct electricity, the valence and conduction bands actually overlap, and it's very easy for electrons to move from the valence to conduction band and move around in the material, thus conducting electricity. There are other materials we call semiconductors that have a forbidden band, but that's fairly small, and therefore it is possible to excite electrons out of the valence band into the conduction band. And we'll cover more of this as we talk about absorption. In some materials, the application of an electric field is sufficient to raise an electron from the valence to the conduction band. When a photon is absorbed in material, the photon's energy is usually transferred to an electron. If this is not enough energy to excite the electron from the valence into the conduction band, that excess energy is released as heat. In some materials, even if the photon energy is enough to excite the electron into the conduction band, it quickly returns to the valence band, also giving off its energy as heat. In some materials, a photon can excite an electron into the conduction band. When the electron returns to the valence band, it emits its excess energy as a photon. The energy of the emitted photon is determined by the energy of the forbidden band. Materials that absorb light energy and emit some of that light energy out as photons are called fluorescing materials. Many materials fluoresce, including some plastics like nylon and many organics, such as grease. In this experiment, we'll see what happens to this dab of grease as we illuminate it with ultraviolet light. As we turn on the ultraviolet light, everything seems to take a pinkish cast now this is because the color filters in the camera don't do a good job of blocking ultraviolet. I'll put a yellow filter in front of the camera that blocks the ultraviolet light, and you can see that the grease fluoresces in the green region. 
Another material known to fluoresce is the resin used to make printed circuit board material. Here we have a printed circuit board under the camera. We'll turn out the lights and turn on the UV light source and place a yellow filter over the camera. You can see the strong fluorescence from the printed circuit board material. The final absorption effect we'll take a look at is very important in machine vision. It's called the photoelectric effect. When a photon excites an electron from the valence into the conduction band in a semiconductor, an electric field can sweep that free electron away, allowing a sensor to count the arrival of a photon. This is the basis of solid-state image sensors used in all machine vision. We are going to turn our attention from absorption back to transmission. In the previous video, we talked about transmission and refraction, and specifically the index of refraction, as if the index of refraction were a constant. But it's not. The index of refraction changes for different wavelengths of light in all materials. The degree to which the index of refraction changes is called dispersion. This graph shows the index of refraction for one kind of glass. You note that it changes with wavelength. The classic way to show dispersion is to use a prism. Here I have an equilateral prism that I'll place in a beam of white light. We'll turn the room lights off and look at the results. In the top you can see the refracted beam and you can see that the colors are being dispersed with red towards the left and blue towards the right. While talking about index of refraction, we should note that there are some materials that have an index of refraction that depends on the polarization of light. We call these birefringent materials. And birefringent materials have a fast axis with a lower index of refraction and a slow axis with a higher index of refraction. Light energy is refracted less when its polarization is aligned with the fast axis and more when its polarization is aligned with the slow axis. Here's a simple demonstration. I'll place this calcite crystal, calcite is a birefringent material, onto this printing. You can see a double image. The printing is refracted to two different positions depending on the polarization of the light that's returning. Now if I place a polarizer over the camera and rotate it, you'll see that as I rotate the polarizer, the position of the printing shifts. Here's another demonstration of birefringence. I have a light table with a polarizer on it. If I put a clear plastic knife in the camera's field of view, you notice that it just looks like a clear plastic knife. However, if I put a polarizer over the camera lens and cross it, a configuration we call a polarizer analyzer, and now put the knife in, what you see is something quite remarkable. Where there is strain in the plastic, there is birefringence, and this birefringence is wavelength dependent, and you see different colors depending on how the polarization is modified by the birefringence. We can use birefringent materials to change linearly polarized light into circularly polarized light. Let's review what we have covered about how light waves combine. Recall that if we have two linearly polarized light waves of the same frequency and phase propagating in the same direction, but that are oriented in different angles, the waves effectively combine to form one linearly polarized wave. However, if we change just one characteristic, the phase between the waves, something interesting happens. If the phase is changed by, say, 90 degrees, then when the waves combine, they give a resulting electrical field that is not linear, but is circular. Thus, it is possible to have circularly polarized light. It is actually quite easy to create circularly polarized light using a linear polarizer and some birefringent material. If the birefringent material has a thickness such that the difference in delay between its fast and slow axes is one quarter of a wave, it is called a quarter wave plate. 
If the axes of a quarter wave plate are oriented 45 degrees to the axis of a linear polarizer, circularly polarized light is created. It is said that nature abhors a vacuum, and this is true for light also, and it leads us to the discussion of diffraction. When light passes an edge that blocks some of the light energy, a virtual light vacuum is created. However, the ends of the light waves radiate some of their energy into this light vacuum. The result are fringes at the ends of the waves as shown in this animation. To see how diffraction impacts machine vision, imagine a light wave focused to a point by a lens as animated here. However, this is not exactly what happens. At the ends of the light waves, we have diffraction that causes some spreading out of the energy. The actual point is not in perfectly sharp focus. For an otherwise perfect lens, the point is focused into a pattern called an array disk, having some width and surrounded by alternating light and dark rings. In another video series on forming images, we'll revisit the effects of diffraction as they limit the resolving capability of lenses. For our final topic of discussion, we'll talk about interference, how light interacts with light. Imagine that you have two beams of light of the same frequency intersecting each other as shown in this animation. You can begin to see light and dark areas. Of course, you can't see the actual wave crests and valleys in light, so consider what you would see if you looked across the intersection of the waves. At the intersection, the light waves combine either constructively, where they are in phase and their amplitudes add, or destructively, where they are out of phase and their amplitudes subtract. Again, we can't see the actual light wave. What we see is the amplitude of the resulting wave. This leads us to observe bright peaks where there is constructive interference and dark areas where there is destructive interference. When we use coherent light sources such as lasers in machine vision, we are very likely to encounter interference. Also, optical interference is a useful tool in microscopy for performing some machine vision tasks. You've certainly covered a lot in this video, starting with Fresnel reflection and how the polarization of light is affected by its reflection off of transparent surfaces. And then we went into fluorescence, how absorbed light energy can emit photons, and the photoelectric effect, so important in image sensing in machine vision. We talked about dispersion, how the index of refraction can change with the wavelength of light and birefringence, how the, in some materials the index of refraction changes depending on the polarization of the light. And we talked about diffraction, how light bends, and this limits the optical resolution we can have in a vision system. And finally, we talked about interference, how light interacts with itself that can make life more interesting or more challenging for you. Well, now you've learned a lot about light, and you're ready to go into how we sense light and image sensors. And that's the topic for another series of videos.